Welcome to our inaugural episode of Hames and Henderson Chilliwack Now. In each episode, we'll be exploring issues we think are relevant to Chilliwack Now. And I'm very excited to be working alongside Paul Henderson, the editor of the Chilliwack Progress. If anybody can help us understand what's on people's minds, it's going to be Paul. Paul? <laughs> Thanks, Clint. I think having a former mayor and yourself and somebody who continues to be plugged into the issue of the day will give us a great chance to bring the right issues to the show. We'll have some interesting and intelligent guests as we make our way through topics we think are important to you. Each topic we've gathered some people we think will bring an interesting and informed perspective. Thanks, Paul. Well, let's get started. When we return, we'll be focusing on an issue I think may be one of the hottest topics of them all, housing. We'll be back with more after this message. We're back, and there isn't likely a topic anywhere that is more important to people these days, especially in the Lower Mainland, than housing and housing affordability. Today, uh, we're going to explore some of that topic with our guest, Paul. Yeah, today we have with us uh, Kelly Patton. Kelly is the MLA for Chilliwack, Kent. So thanks for making time for us today. My pleasure. Kelly, I think the first question from me is, what is the government's overall strategy with respect to housing and housing affordability? Is there something that they're looking at to say, this is kind of our, our guiding principle around how we're going to start making decisions about uh, housing affordability, uh, especially uh, folks that are first-time buyers or perhaps renters? Where's the government's position now? Where are they basing their policies on? Yeah, so the, the BC provincial government, which is, you know, what, what I can speak to, have their housing plan. And the focus is really on making sure that there's enough supply, making sure that the supply is affordable, and making sure that all levels of renters and home buyers are supported uh, and can access the market. So there's a 30-point plan. Uh, there's already significant work on stock, uh, with housing starts being higher than uh, 2017. You know, it's, it's really taking off there. They're also focused on the affordability lens um, with policy decisions and policy directions that, that can help both renters and buyers. And one of the really big things that we're always focused on is making sure that the responses uh, make sense in the different regions. So I'm focused here in Chilliwack, Kent, um, and a lot of the things that I see here, you know, we've had over 400 uh, homes either started or announced. Uh, and that's really exciting, but the best part is that it's also a matter of, it's at different levels. We have these announcements made for people who are low income renters, um, or we have medium renters or buyers. We have spaces available for people who are homeless or street, street entrenched, um, people who need additional supports. So it's really across the board. And I think that it's important to just be really aware that the approach to housing and affordability, because they go hand in hand, um, is really a multi-pronged approach. And so there are a lot of different pieces and a lot of different points that uh, people can discuss and people can contribute to um, you know, as, as we move forward, because everybody deserves a home. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Paul? Yeah, I'm just wondering what you, your take would be on how, how much the government should be involved. And obviously the, the, the market decides a lot of what's being built and where it's being built and the density. Do, do you, where, do you, where do you see the government's role and, and what should be done? Yeah, so our government is committed to everyone moving forward together. So that includes action. That requires responsibility to be taken to make sure that that is an attainable thing. And I think we are well on our way in our 10-year plan to making sure that that happens. Uh, we aren't the only people involved, though, like you mentioned, how much should we be involved? The market, you know, is very high, and we know it. It's in the news every day, as it should be. Um, but it is the responsibility of the BC government to step in where appropriate to develop policy um, and to offer financial support. So, for example, in Budget 2022, we've accelerated uh, a financial commitment that we made it's coming this year, $100 million accelerated into supporting the development of homes for people um, so that 
homes in BC are affordable. So things like that are absolutely appropriate. We're also working with municipalities to make sure that any barriers there to approving and zoning, um, you know, so that they have the support they need to make sure that they're responsive to the people that we all serve together. So I think that that's a, a bit of, you know, it's a complex question, a mm -hmm. little bit of a complex answer, and I'm sure we could talk about that part all day. But I do think um, that people agree that the government is, you know, needs to take responsibility. And so we are stepping up um, and stepping up in ways of partnership as well. So we're working with municipalities. We're also working with First Nations to build on-reserve housing, uh, which is, you know, some people m might not have known or thought that that would be a provincial responsibility, but it's needed and we need to take care of people in BC. So we're doing it. Let me ask you this. It sounds like what uh, I heard you say was that it's a supply side issue. There isn't enough supply and the government is working to try to increase supply of housing, uh, working with municipalities to say, are there barriers to getting more supply, um, encouragement through financial contributions and that. Let me drop a bomb and say uh, one of the biggest impediments to increasing supply is in fact land, especially in the lower mainland where we're uh, encumbered with essentially a provincial agricultural zone that says you can't uh, develop on there. Is there any thought or is there any discussion about saying maybe housing is more important than agriculture and maybe we should look at reevaluating areas of uh, British Columbia and especially the lower mainland uh, with respect to the, its, con its uh, being in the agricultural land reserve? I think that's a really great question. So it's a perfect example of how people say, okay, I have a simple question, and it's, it's not a simple question. So if we, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to speak in definitives, but generally, if we were to interfere with ALR in order to build more housing and then didn't have local food to feed the people in the homes, that would be a massive problem. Uh, we just recently were, you know, we, we all went through the, the events of the atmospheric river. We were cut off. Having local food and local food production is incredibly important as our population grows. There are a multitude of options and solutions for different kinds of housing. The way we do it and the way we've done it is only one way. Maybe it's a question of densification. Maybe it's a question of other living arrangements. And you're seeing it popping up in government uh, policies and, and papers across the, the country, across the province, uh, across the world, around the world, really. So do I think that it's a, it's a simple, you know, do we use the land for housing instead of food? Is it a simple question? No, I, I don't think it's a simple question. But we're going to need the food and we're going to need it locally if we're going to address our climate issues and our housing issues. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that we have had the biggest influx of, of people into British Columbia, like in a net number, mm -hmm. in 30 years. And yet we have the lowest number of listings for rentals and sales in 30 years. It's not only a supply problem, but it is a supply problem. But it's, a, it's an issue bigger than that as well that has so many more levers that we can all collectively pull to, to make it better and move forward. Can I just ask you about what your government does dealing with municipalities? Or are you, the municipalities um, obviously have, deal with zoning, mm -hmm. and a lot of the issues. And Chilliwack is, you know, you're riding, and Chilliwack is, you know, sixty-seven percent of the city of Chilliwack is in the ALR, and the and and a lot of the land, developable land, is on the hillsides. So really, the only place to develop anymore is the hillsides or densification, uh, and. A lot of people think we get we get people complaining about too much density and things are too close together, but a lot of people would say that's just the way it needs to needs to go, and and, and maybe the cities need to be um, made to open up their OCPs to further density. I'm just wondering what you think about that. I think that when cities or municipalities are doing their zoning, and I do I serve the District of Kent as well, so I've mm -hmm. got a few different, uh, a couple di few different mayors and councils that may have similar or different approaches. Um, you're right that there's a lot of people who think, okay, that the way it was done is not working, uh, we're gonna have to do it this way, and there's just as many people who are saying, nope, like, we're gonna have to spread out more. Um, and the issues that the city are having not specifically the city of Chilliwack, but generally, 
are how to balance that and what the philosophy and approach to housing locally is. And I think that, uh, for example, Minister Eby was here uh, recently and he was seeing for himself and spoke with, with mayor and council and, um, you know, the province being available to really help support the city and all, all the municipalities in making the decisions that best serve their, the folks that live in, in their areas is going to be important and it might be new because at the end of the day, if there's a barrier that needs to be removed, that needs to be a partnership that works together to remove the barrier. And if that means that there's um, a need for more understanding about the importance of densification or, or different decisions that need to be made about space or land use, uh, the province and the municipalities working together and, and clearing those barriers is gonna be really important. So I'm not sure exactly what it will look like. I'm eager to see it because I think that this partnership is, it needs to take the next step because we have a challenge that has taken a next step. I think it's good news hearing talk about partnerships between the province and cities that coming from the city side for many years. That hasn't always been the philosophy, but it needs to be as we move forward with things as complex uh, the issues as uh, food versus houses or uh, densification versus uh, hillside development and all of those things. So, Kelly, I want to thank you for taking some time to talk about this with us today. It's really important that we talk about this as a community, uh, and I know uh, Paul feels the same way. Yeah, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks thank you so much. Me. We're going to be back uh, after a message from our sponsors again, and we're going to be joined by two other guests who are uh, going to talk about this issue further. We're going to be joined by Keyshawn Roy, who is a Vancouver-based housing advocate, uh, acknowledged by many as an expert in the area of housing and affordable housing, and Daniel Bosile, and you'll re recognize Daniel's name uh, from uh, posters around town selling uh, real estate. She's a, a very successful commercial and residential realtor who has her finger on the pulse of the local Chilliwack market. So we'll be back after these messages. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we just had uh, lots of good information from our MLA, Kelly Padden, and we're talking about housing, and we thought it would be a really great idea to get a couple of folks into the studio with Paul and I to expand on some of those themes and those topics. So we're really delighted to welcome a couple of guests. Paul? Yes, our first panelist is Keyshawn Roy. Uh, Keyshawn is a housing advocate and the author of Make Housing Central, about the affordable housing crisis in BC. They are the former CEO of the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, and they're running for as a candidate for Vancouver City Council this October. Which is pretty exciting. We can have some <laughs> conversations uh, later about what that process is like. Uh, our second guest is Daniel Bolsley. Folks will recognize Danielle's name from our community. She is a local uh, realtor involved in uh, the real estate industry in both commercial and residential, uh, known as an entrepreneur and a business person and spent most of her life in Chilliwack. So we're very excited to have her local perspective on this particular issue. And I guess the first question that we have for both of you is, how did we get here? We're in a place in Chilliwack and the Lower Mainland where we have uh, house prices that we've never, never, ever seen and escalating at such an enormous rate. Uh, how did we get here? That's the first thing I want to ask. But before we do that, what I think I should probably do is have you talk just a little bit about yourselves, how you got into the seats you're in today. So maybe you can introduce yourselves a little bit. That'll give our audience a little bit of familiarity. Sure, you. and thank you for having me out in Chilliwack. I, I really love this place and I came out here to, to learn a bit, so hopefully I'll understand what's going on locally. My background is more in what's happened provincially and federally over the past uh, a decade or two in, 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 in housing. Um, as you mentioned, I wrote a book called Make Housing Central. Uh, I did that when I was chairing the BC Rental Housing Coalition. And so we spent uh, quite a few years touring everywhere in the province, collecting data. And in uh, from about 2013 to 2018, we're making the case that all of this federal investments and provincial investments and local changes that are happening in housing needed to be done. And back then, we weren't sure we were right. 
And so uh, today we are, and we can see the strengths and weaknesses of our data and, and the suffering that's happened in our communities because, because of it. So I'm somebody who, uh, for the past 10 years, has worked in all areas uh, of, of housing, and before that worked in government for a long list of uh, MLAs and cabinet ministers and party leaders provincially and federally. And we're delighted you're here. Danielle, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get right into that question. Yeah, wow, and thanks for having me. My, uh, my experience probably is not quite as specific as yours, a little bit um, more of a broader range. So uh, as you said earlier, I've spent the majority of my life in Chilliwack. Um, I spent a lot of time in real estate, not necessarily as a realtor, but just watching what's going on in the market, buying, selling, watching uh, development happen. I've always been pretty fascinated on, um, you know, the part that municipality plays in how real estate gets developed. So now actually being a realtor and buying and selling for other people and having to look at the zoning and, and what's going to be a good fit for the community. I uh, have a much better perspective of, of why why municipalities make the, the choices they make and and how that impacts uh, rental housing and also affordability as well. Awesome. So let's get to it. What's what's driving what we're seeing today in terms of the price increases? Kishan. Uh, the number one thing is 30 years of us doing nothing, pretty much, when it came to building rental housing across this whole country. And it's the communities that grew the most over the past 30 years, think of even like Burnaby and probably Chilliwack, um, who had no federal or provincial support during that growth that are suffering the most. And what started as a crisis uh, that people started to see here in BC is now completely national. I'm hearing from uh, housing advocates and politicians uh, from every piece of this country uh, that, uh, that we made a big mistake for a very long time. We have a lot of work to do to fix it and it's not gonna happen quickly. So, Paul? Yeah, where, where's that, what should have been done then? Well, we used to build rental housing and not just uh, social housing and not just co-ops, but purpose-built rental housing used to comprise some of the mix of housing that we built. However, in Vancouver, for example, we got down to only 5% of the homes being built being purpose-built rental in a community where 50 to 55% of people rent. So we were building a lot of mansions and a lot of small condos for ownership. Uh, it's not like we weren't building during that time, but we weren't building anything attached to what local incomes are. And that's probably happening now uh, all over the place as people are realizing we built a product for an investment class and not for the residents of our community. And if you look at who's become homeless because of this crisis, in most communities, it's 75 to 80% of people who are unsheltered are local residents. Uh, that have built, built these communities uh, that we didn't build any housing for. And you know, I understand it's a lot of anxiety to think um, uh, that there's going to be a lot of building ahead and it's going to change the shape of our community, but it's work we should have been doing for a long time. So Danielle, what's the, what's the mix in Chilliwack like? When, if you look at the, the overall mix from rentals to uh, owned condos to townhouses to rental stock and housing. What does that mix look like in Chilliwack right now? Well, I mean, I think it essentially mirrors what you said. There really is not a lot of purpose-built rentals. So what we find here is um, a lot of single-family homes with suites that people will rent out um, or condos. But the same thing with the prices of housing drastically increasing, it would stand to reason that the rents also have to go up because the mortgages are higher and that's unaffordable and attainable for a lot of people. From, you know, what I what I see that's going to happen over the next, I'd say, five to ten years, there absolutely are plans to have purpose-built rentals, um, but that's five to ten years away, so. Are there options here in Chilliwack for somebody who wants to rent for three seventy five a month? Uh, yeah, 12 roommates in a basement suite, if you can find in it. A basement. Because right now in BC, if you're a person with a disability or an income assistance, that is how much our government gives to an individual to find rent. And I've met people uh, with a long range of disabilities, from military veterans to people with Down syndrome, who come to me with this mathematical problem. Okay, this is what the government has told me is, uh, I have for shelter. What are my options? And there's zero, or there's very complicated, weird ones, or there's yeah. boats, or there's uh, a small percentage of public housing. And so part of the problem is we are completely detached as people from the life of experiences of our most vulnerable citizens. And the, econo uh, the economy that we're asking them to live in is a false one where the math doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. So 
You mentioned we stopped doing anything for 30 years. What were we doing? I think this gets at Paul's question yeah. too. What were we doing for 30 years that we're not doing now? And you said we're investing in, we weren't, we're not investing in rental stock. Who's not investing? Is it, is it the, uh, the construction and development industry that's not investing? Are there not proper incentives for them to do that? Was the government through agencies like CMHC building, uh, actually putting money in and building that stock? Who's not investing today? Well, the number one new player back at the table, and we were in a budget week this week, is the federal government. But the federal government also, you know, used to incentivize private purpose-built rentals across the country. Those programs uh, disappeared. You can see them on the landscape, though. In most cities, there's these three-story rental buildings somewhere in your town that were built in the 70s and 80s under a program called MERB. And, uh, you know, people are familiar with them, but they didn't exist for years. So where, where is my kid who's going to high school, if they want to pick to go to high school, or go to university, I mean, in, in uh, Victoria or... Uh, out here in the Fraser Valley, where are they gonna stay? We didn't build things for our own children in our own society because we were waiting for uh, uh, an investment payoff. And we also, I don't think, had very good data. Uh, for all the advocacy we do now, the truth is that for many years, we didn't know how big the problem was uh, and we didn't know how big it would become. And in places like Chilliwack, I'm not sure that people here had a lot of confidence that there would be a great economic expansion and opportunity after things like the base closed. I remember a lot of fear. I remember places in uh, Tumblr Ridge and Tassis going for $25,000, $30,000 because nobody thought that anybody would want to live there. So over that period of time, we weren't building because we didn't know this was coming to some extent. And part of the reason is because our data collection on rental in specific was very poor as a people. Mm, absolutely. So, Danielle, you mentioned uh, local governments. You interface with local governments all the time in the work that you do on behalf of clients or have in the past on your own behalf. What more do you think local governments could do to encourage, speed up, facilitate the development of rental stock in that community? You know, I think uh, the Lower Mainland specifically, um, you know, all the way from Vancouver out to Hope, we're limited on, on what we can do. We have things like the mountains, the border, um, the agricultural land reserve, all of these things prohibit growth um, and, and building. And so all of that has to be accounted for. And, you know, I, I don't have an answer to what can governments do. I think that Specifically in Chilliwack, uh, we've done a, a, a very good job of responsible growth and expansion, but it's still limited by the, the geographical um, limitations, and and the the ALR plays a huge a huge role in, in in what we can build. And you know, again, locally, I'm speaking specifically to the city of Chilliwack because I do a lot of work here. Um, the city is very good at looking at what can be rezoned and what that process looks like and helping people navigate it. I mean, I deal with a lot of a lot of people that come from other places and over and over the comment is what a great city to work with because they are willing to listen to what they want to do. I have uh, one client that's looking at building 90 rental units um, downtown and the city was like, Great, glad you're doing it. How can we help you? What, what can we do to facilitate this process? So I, I think it's happening. It's just, it's maybe a little bit late because it doesn't help the people now that are yeah. trying to either get into the market or even to have affordable rentals. And there are rentals being built, which is, which is which somewhat surprised me. The new building next to the CMA, Chilliwack Middle School, six-story building, mm -hmm. is, a, is going to be a, is a rental building. And most of what's being developed on the old Safeway site is, is I understand, to be rentals. It's going to be so rentals, yep. It seems like, it seems like it's maybe starting to happen again. It's coming, but it's it just didn't come quick enough, right? Because yeah. this housing crisis has been growing at, at a rapid rate over the last you know couple of years, and it's really hard for government to respond in in a quick way to, to make things happen. But I mean, I, I do personally think that um, at least locally, anyway, we're doing a we're doing a really good job. I mean, we've had last year's stats said a thousand people came into the into the Fraser Valley alone. Last month, three thousand people really? came in 
who's buying this and where are they, where are they going? Well, uh, in my mind, what we've created in places further to the west of us is economic refugees who have uh, value in property, but uh, they, which they can cash in, and then they start moving east, which continues to displace people. People from Vancouver with the means to do so sell and move to Surrey, and those folks move to Langley, and those folks move to Abbotsford, and those folks. So we see that bouncing out the valley, but I'm very interested... Danielle talks about uh, Keyshawn. She says Chilliwack's very easy to deal with and you can get things uh, turned over quickly and things get moving. Is that the experience you see where you come from, which is Vancouver? Not yet, but um, There's no for all I said before about the challenges we've had uh, in understanding this issue, I don't think we're at that place today. I think public the public is leading on this issue and public support uh, for new forms of housing, for middle housing, for townhomes, which you know don't exist in BC in very large quantity compared to other places. There's just so much more public support. That's driving politicians, it's choosing the politicians that get elected, and it's changing the shape of the budgets that they're bringing in municipally, uh, federally, uh, and provincially. Um, and so, my sense is, though, that uh, the provincial government uh, is going to have to do uh, is going to have to bring in some difficult measures for municipalities to change the way they, they do things. Because I watched one city council in one of our major cities debate half an hour to an hour with all of their council and all of their staff and everybody watching on TV, one duplex. That pace of change is not good enough. And in Vancouver, uh, you have a council that is working so hard, they believe in what they're doing and they believe in the processes they've set up, so they're just grinding it out hour after hour, deep, deep into the night to try and approve things instead of fixing a broken system. And I think some of those changes to the broken system are going to have to happen provincially, uh, and uh, they can't come soon enough. I would urge the minister to make them a lot sooner. Well, I think you, you touched on a nerve for me when you talked about the duplex. And, and Paul had the joy of covering this as a, as a reporter. You at, covered a duplex at, once? No, <laughs> no at, at, at city council meetings. And um, I could hear sometimes Paul's eyes rolling uh, from my seat in the mayor's chair when people were uh, debating that very thing, saying uh, that rental units or duplexes uh, would destroy their neighborhood, would literally destroy their neighborhood. And one duplex project could drive out a hundred people to speak at a public hearing. Well, and there used to be a real stigma around renting and rental yeah, buildings absolutely. and everything too. I think it had gotten into our psychology that there was this uh, home ownership. It wasn't just a dream for everybody, but it was the path for everybody and the only path. And, you know, it's, it's just not real life. Yeah. It was just yeah. a dream. Yeah, yeah and the, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of change in the last 50... I've been in Chillac for 15 years. And, and yeah, the, the amount of, of uh, nitpicking or nimbyism you'd get about literally a duplex or, or, or a huge lot turning it into townhouses was just unbelievable, the complaints. But, but it's, it's happening more and more in Chilliwack, and obviously the need is there. I, th I think we, and sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no. you, but you know, I think we as a whole need to change our mindset. Um, and, and I'm seeing that with, with the migration east, right? So people that have been in Chilliwack a long time, we want a 10,000 square foot lot with a single family home and mm -hmm. heaven forbid we should have a suite in the bottom and rent it out. That's not what we want. Uh, and that's, that is not realistic. It's not obtainable for most people. Uh, and it really doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at responsible growth. We should be focusing more on density, which again, I think um, we are doing. It just, it takes, it takes time to change these, these processes and, and make this vision a, a reality and also to, to change the mindset if you're if just to um, step away from the rental market for a second, but even for those that do have the luxury of being able to buy, we need to really change that mindset of, of, of what, you know, what's a really good buy. And is it the single family home on the 10,000 square foot lot? Not a lot of that exists anymore. But why does that have to be so much better than, you know, a tower with, with density that can create housing for so many people and it can be maybe mixed use or whatever, um, or, or having it, you know, solely owner occupied, whatever, it's still providing an affordable place for more people to live using up less of a, less of a footprint. I think that will be the great challenge of this decade for a lot of communities is how to build affordable homes in sustainable communities that are connected to each other. Yeah. Housing, climate, 
the trains. I think these things are coming together to change the shape of what our cities look like and the lifestyles people want to lead in them. Well, I think the most successful communities to me are also communities that are inclusive, that are looking at not just uh, a range of different people living in those communities, but a range of different incomes that are living in those communities so that a, a neighborhood shouldn't just be 10,000 square foot single family homes here, mm -hmm. duplexes over here, towers over here, townhouses over here. We should be mixing those because we then learn from each other and learn that it takes everybody to make a community. Well, and you can you can see this happening even in the in the current development that's happening. Take um, you know Iron Horse or, or Base Ten, that kind of area yeah. there, right? It's yeah. it's wonderful. They have uh, really a mix. You have your single family homes. You definitely aren't sitting on a ten thousand square foot lot, but you have a nice little yard in the back. You're surrounded by townhomes. You have apartments. Your you know, walkability factor is huge, so you talk about a, a sustainable community, you have a great schools for your kids, um, you know, they're safe, they, they attract all different demographics, and it, it, in my mind, makes a lot of sense. And I, I used that one example, but um, you know, those types of developments are, are popping up everywhere. And <clears throat> you know, when you purchase in a, in a, a, develop, a developer-driven project, uh, you have what's called a, a cooling off period. Uh, I think somebody had asked earlier what, what government is doing. Um, I don't know if that's so much government or the real estate council, but anyway, in the, in the developments, the new builds, you can write up an offer for whatever you want, um, and then you have seven days. You can rescind that offer for any reason. And I know it's been discussed um, to maybe do the same thing in non-developer-driven offers. So, you know, for instance, any, any offer uh, that somebody would write, they would have seven days to, to rescind that offer. And my thoughts on that are it creates a whole, a whole issue, a whole flurry of problems. I mean, I recently had a deal where uh, the guy used two different realtors and he made, actually, I think he had three different realtors. Somehow he ended up having offers on, on three houses and he wrote way above just to get them because the market's so crazy. So he got all three of them um, and then just was like, I'm just going to not complete. And so now that leaves, you have three sellers who have, think their houses are sold and have purchased other homes. Mm. This guy doesn't, it's, it's a nightmare. So I think if you, if you, if you in, implemented that cooling off period in regular offers, it would create a whole another problem. It probably points out that we, know, we, we tend to focus, or I do, and, and maybe Keyshawn because he's... Uh, losing his mind and getting involved in politics again, that we tend to focus on what can government do. But there's other regulatory bodies that have a role to play that we need to make sure we're paying attention to oh, as well in terms yeah. of housing, like real estate councils and laws and all of those things. The so, real estate council so, is, yeah. well, I mean, if you, if, if you ask me as a realtor, it's a little bit of a nightmare story if anyone's watching, because <laughs> there is so much paperwork and the average consumer finds that paperwork difficult to to get through, but they do a really good job of, of regulating things and making sure that, that people are protected. And, you know, even so in this market, you have, um, you know, an offer presentation date, like, isn't that crazy? <laughs> We're not mm. even gonna look at offers until this date, which yeah. in a way is, it's better than um, having that seven day cooling off period. It's more of like a cooling up period, I guess, because you have seven days now to think about what can I afford, what will I be approved for, and what is, a, what is a reasonable offer to put in. And then at least you have a fair shot because they're not looking at anything. And the council um, has regulated that if you're going to do an offer date, it needs to be very clear and everybody has to know about it. Okay, so this has been a great discussion so far, but we've got more we want to talk about. So we'll be back after this break. Welcome back, everyone. We're joined with Keyshawn Roy and Daniel Beausoleil talking about housing. My co-host Paul Henderson and I, we want to get uh, back into the issue of affordability, which is a, a really important discussion. How are we going to find a way to provide 
rents that are going to be affordable for folks that are living on assistance payments. Any strategies out there that you guys are aware of that we could work on? Yeah, uh, I'll start there because I do know of a lot of strategies. And I would say that um, British Columbia is probably ahead of the whole continent when it comes to the size and scope of the amount of affordable rental housing that is being proposed, that is already funded, and that is being built. I think the rest of this continent is behind us and are going to have to learn from our struggles as uh, we go through. So what are we doing? What, who's doing that and what are we doing? Yeah, so at the provincial government level, they've funded a 10-year plan. It mentions 114,000 units of uh, affordable rental housing, but expect during that time the private market also to deliver some affordable rental housing through things like inclusionary zoning. Expect the private market to actually build uh, housing that's linked to people's incomes because uh, city councils and the provinces are asking for that more. The market is demanding it in a way they didn't before when uh, builders were focused on an investment class. So I think um, uh, the provincial government, private sector builders, and I would say the other thing is our co-op movement here in BC is one mm -hmm. of the strongest in the world, and I think people might underestimate uh, how important something like that can be. Because the new way that co-ops and social housing are being built in BC, which is different than what we built in the 70s and the 80s, these developments will be affordable in perpetuity. So there is a mix of incomes. Instead of it being a whole bunch of people who all pay 375, you have a whole band of different family types at different incomes that make the development uh, pay for itself through their rents. Uh, and the government is coming in, provincial, federally, and municipally can do this with uh, uh, zoning and uh, uh, levy uh, uh, right of ways. But the mortgage on the building can be paid by the rents because there's been enough capital infusion at the start. It used to be that we would, as a society, provide ongoing operating subsidy to every social housing and co-op housing project everywhere in the country, like a monthly check. Now it's different. We're getting in up front, we're building it big enough that uh, it can be self-financing, and we have you know, good professionalism in the, in the sector to be able to deliver on. So I feel a lot of confidence that over this next 10 years, here in BC, we'll be building different types of housing that are financed differently, um, and that are being built faster. You know, BC and Alberta are also real leaders in modular technology. Uh, if you look too up in, uh, uh, in Merritt, they're starting to look into different fabrication methods to replace things there, including 3D printing and hybrid printing uh, of homes. And out at UBC, uh, we're becoming uh, uh, technological leaders in wood frame building. So we're going to build things a lot differently, and it's going to be a bunch of stuff we invent right here at home. Interesting. Mm. So, Danielle, uh, co-ops were mentioned. Now, do we have co-ops in Chilliwack? Do we have co-op housing in Chilliwack? Not a lot. I mean, to, to my knowledge, there's only one project, and honestly, I don't know a lot about it. So, so I mean, I think if it probably was, and I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying if it was a really successful concept, I probably would know more about no. it because anyone trying to to get into the market, that might be a nice, a nice option. This week's federal budget had the first uh, dedicated fundings for co-ops in uh, 30 years in Canada. So it's a thing we forgot about. So Paul, you know, you, well, you've explored co-ops as, as an individual and uh, Yeah, as briefly, the, the Yarrow Eco Village is the, um, the, really the only co-op in, in town. And we, I looked, we even looked into it, my wife and I considered it at one point, but it wasn't really for us. But I always, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the co-op model seems more of a big city um, uh, idea. And, and maybe Chilliwack is too small for it? Is that, is that? No, I will correct you if you're wrong. I've seen very successful co-ops, and most of them are very small. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, what we're seeing with these new larger ones in Vancouver is because of the success of all of these small ones, largely in Vancouver and Victoria, but they're everywhere in the province in a, in a small scale, working together to create a strong provincial and federal association, to create the community land trust so that they have the financing tools in place. So it used to be when you joined a co-op, you would all have to split up all of these different jobs from uh, financing to maintenance to uh, all the work that goes in to build it, whereas today uh, you have uh, 
much more professional operation and uh, more efficient tools that you can use. What you do need is a critical mass of people, could be like 10 or 20, who are interested in this, or a builder that comes in, like a, a land trust. Um, but this might be the first time a lot of cities, and it could be Chilliwack, uh, see co new co-ops being built because it, it's one example of an area where the federal government just uh, stopped funding it for a long time. One of the things we see popping up often is the notion of, and this is for likely the one end of the spectrum, tiny homes where people say, well, we, you know, we only need 50, 60, 70, 100 square feet, and we should be looking at that as an option. Are either of you aware of any places where that's been an option and been successful? I'm not aware of, of large-scale developments where it's been, but I'll tell you what the challenges are. I get approached weekly uh, about tiny homes, and the challenges are finding a zoning where you can fit them. So, uh, you know, even agricultural land, you may be able to get uh, a secondary dwelling on it, which, which could be a tiny home, but that there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to go with that, and there's, you know, a lot of rules around it. So... If it's not ALR land and it's on, like, I don't know, say just an acreage somewhere, you're generally not allowed to have more than, than a principal residence and maybe one one secondary home. So yeah. you, it, it's, it's not feasible to charge a smaller amount. The owner of the land is still going to want to lease out that land to wherever that tiny home is going to go. And if you're only allowed to put one on it, it's still going to drive the... And it strikes me that the, the cost of servicing... A tiny home is the same cost of servicing a large home. You still have sewer, you still have water, you still have electrical, and you have engineered, and, yeah. and so it, it, that's why I'm asking the question. It, it seems like a good idea, but is it is it practical from an economic perspective? It, it, not currently, because of what Danielle said about the zoning. Yeah. It's such a regulatory burden to build something so simple that often you'll spend more time in years fighting city hall. Uh, or fighting a zoning code, then you will actually be building and, and living in it. However, I do think that gentle density, all of these things that come uh, uh, in different shapes and sizes and smaller, will be on the agenda of uh, every city council uh, in this province over the next uh, five, ten years, because homeowners want different options. And also, it's not sustainable to have laws that say, you can only build bigger all the time. Some people actually want to live in a tiny home. I've rented them. I think it's a great lifestyle choice. And it often comes down to the land and the community. I've seen projects uh, aimed at uh, people who are unsheltered uh, that, that are a little larger scale. But more often with tiny homes, you're talking about uh, everything from place infill uh, or places where homes of a larger size just wouldn't fit, or people choosing it for lifestyle choices or reconfiguring uh, a, a lot. I think it's a lot of potential because the setup cars costs aren't as high as you think, and most people who want to live that lifestyle are uh, living a carbon neutral lifestyle, which saves us in many other ways. So I, um, I would urge anybody who's just interested in them to start dipping their toe into the water whether it's as a place you might want to live or a thing you might want to build uh, or from a real estate perspective, a thing you might want to welcome into your community in a, in a gentle way in different Pla places. Placement is hard, though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's nothing, it's a great lifestyle if that's, if that's what you want to do. But uh, the reality is they're not, they're not cheap. I mean, yeah. I guess compared to building a new home, they're, they're cheaper, but they're, they're definitely not inexpensive. And then you have to find... Um, somewhere, to, somewhere to put them, and you have to lay all the groundwork for that, and get all the municipal approvals for that. It's and like it's, the new duplex. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be right? people are going to say, "Whoa, that! Uh, do I want those in my neighborhood?" Uh, but it's true. tiny homes, yeah. duplexes, uh, townhouses, modular homes, like uh, uh, you know, even walk-up uh, apartments. All of these things, we just really got to uh, fill in the middle of our housing. Yeah spectrum and continuum because we really just had these very small condos and very large mansions and everything rotting in between instead of uh, giving people options. The mobility of humans in a society is what creates, and you know, mm -hmm. I, it's not just accessibility if you're a disabled person and you have no economic 
mobility. There's also a social mobility to be able to move closer to a job that you want or a family you want to be a part of or need to be a part of. We've taken mobility away from people uh, by constricting our housing built form and um, it's created something I call stuckflation where even somebody who has a lot and has a, a, a home doesn't feel like they have any options to downsize when they get older or when the kids leave and doesn't have any uh, options to upsize because everything's been built exactly the same in the, in the, in the neighborhood. So, you know, mobility is going to be something we can offer by exploring these topics. It's exciting to me that uh, Chilliwack is building differently than they have before because I'm not somebody who thinks that sprawl is always the answer. There's a lot of things we can do just by um, doing density differently. Yep. And, and it's becoming more acceptable. People are that's, that's finally what I at would a point. Say. Yeah, the mind the mindset is it has to change and it is changing, especially um, you know from all of the migration east, right? So you get these people that have been in the city and they're used to more density and they come out here and it's absurd to have a, a huge lot and a huge house all by yourself. It's unfathomable. So. You don't just miss the density. It's like uh, all the amenities that come with density become oh. part of your lifestyle. Oh, I can walk to get a coffee. I bet you there's a whole bunch of people watching this who it's not reasonable for them to walk somewhere and get a coffee. That's a normal life experience they should have in their neighborhood <laughs> that, you know, if everybody's got an acre, it's not gonna happen, right? Paul and I are chuckling well, because we live in likely the first neighborhood yeah. that was developed in Chilliwack in a kind of a new urban style where there's a mix of densities where it's walkable, where everything uh, is within walking distance. And uh, I, I know Paul would- And there's uh, a mix of, 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 of Housing. There's there's townhouses. There's single family homes. There's apartments. Right. I, I live in a single family home, <clears throat> but there's apartments I can see right next to near my house. We can walk to the leisure center. It's a it's a community that was built from the ground up, so they could do it in a really a really good way. So what you lose in land, you make up for in community. And it was a former military base uh, that Lance. you would appreciate as a yeah. as a. An army cadet, you probably would have been on the military base here Well, in yeah, Chilliwack I spent a lot of time on the base yeah. here in Chilliwack, and now I live very close to the old air base in Jericho, yeah. which is uh, going on, going through a large redevelopment yeah. uh, concept. It may have a SkyTrain line uh, attached to it. Same uh, development agency, Canada Lands Company, uh, is doing both, which well, I, I tell you, to... Jericho is one of the best places to meditate in BC right now because <laughs> nobody's around, because nobody can access it. It's, uh, you know, yeah. things like the SkyTrain, nobody can access it financially because the homes cost $6 million yeah. each. Yeah. So once there's uh, some homes and some trains, and you'll start saying, oh, I can go to the beach every day and you can build a lifestyle around it. I have a feeling like, uh, I mean, the base had some density to it. It's not like uh, it was all detached homes. I've stayed in some barracks here in, in Chilliwack in, in the bases, uh, you know. There were 400 units of housing uh, when the base closed. And uh, today, there are 2,200 units on the same footprint. And so, room to grow. And uh, not much well, left, not much. but there, there's 2,200. And there might be 1,000 more units to go, but uh, no, uh, maybe 500 in mm. terms of apartments. But um, that uh, took the density levels. Uh, well, and I think that model is them. being duplicated on the north side as well, right? We're, You're right. we're, we're seeing yeah. that. I mean, I, I'm seeing, I call it responsible density in a lot of the new a lot of the new projects that are coming up and it, it, it's helping to change that mindset which i think is is key in, in being successful because people obviously have to want to buy it and live there and look we've just been through a, a, a pandemic which included isolation and some people liked that like me leave me alone in the woods for my whole life and i'll produce some books and and uh, uh meditate and have a lovely time um but social interaction uh fuels me and many other people in ways that maybe we've forgotten. And there's going to be a lot of people who want neighbors, who want friends, who want social groups they can join. Uh, and, you know, for people with disabilities, um, uh, being in livable communities is really important, particularly with like intellectual uh, disabilities. Uh, we used to lock a lot of people up and never hear from them again. But now as we're starting to communicate to people with a wide range of abilities, they want to live in community. They, they, you know, and uh, saying buy a million dollar mansion up on the hill isn't going to work for somebody who needs daily supports or uh, a community center they can go to and things like that. The wisest person I know said to me one time, if we teach people to grow up 
to expect uniformity in our neighborhoods. So all single family here, all townhouses here, all that. They will be, uh, diversity will be something that's an anathema to them, that they won't, it, it will be a shock to them. But if we teach people to expect diversity, what they'll begin to understand is how much alike we all are. So we're slowly seeing a transition in our lives, I think, from more from uniform neighborhoods to much more diverse neighborhoods. And I think it's a very positive thing. I really do. I wish we could spend the whole damn day talking mm. about this because I'm having so much fun uh, uh, getting the feedback. But we don't have all day, so no. we're going to mm. have to say uh, goodbye to you. Yes, thanks very much for coming, Keyshawn and Danielle. It's been great. Yeah, it's been enjoyable. It's been great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.